Thank you, friend. Okay, thanks everyone for your patience, best laid plans and all of that. Um, today, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the session. The topic of this training is the 1% requirement and Maine's alternate assessments based on alternate academic achievement standards, which is also known by the acronym AAAAAS. Just a couple of quick introductions here as we begin. My name is Jody Basio smith and I serve here at the department in the capacity of director of assessment. I also work very closely on our alternate assessments as well as our ELP assessments for multilingual learners. Leora? Hi, I'm Leora Byers. There's a lot of familiar faces here. Um, I still um, am supporting Jody and the assessment team with the 1% work as I have for the last few years, um, but I have transitioned from the federal general supervision and monitoring team to half time with Tracy special projects and half time with Mary with uh, Mary Adley with state agency clients. So you'll be still seeing me around just in a different capacity. Thanks, Leora. Okay, just a couple of housekeeping um, items. Um, please go ahead and mute your speakers if you haven't done so already. This session is going to be recorded. The link to the recording, the slide deck, and the Q&A document will all be shared via email to everyone who registered to participate, um, as well as I'll send out a, a larger email to directors on the contact list in NEO hopefully by the beginning of next week. The second thing is we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the session today. So please go ahead and record your questions utilizing that Q&A feature down there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, or if you prefer, you can raise a virtual hand um, at the end of the presentation when we're taking questions. Okay. So seven, you're, you're Okay, so let's dive right in. We have five learning objectives for the session today and we have a lot of content for you. We're going to start off with a brief overview of the statutory requirements when it comes to state assessments for all students, including students with significant cognitive disabilities. Two, we're going to discuss why participation matters beyond those requirements. <laughs> There we go. And here we go. After that, we're going to touch on the topic of eligibility for participation in the AA-AAAS and the topic of alternate academic achievement standards, which will then lead us into some considerations around the IEP development. And then finally, we're going to provide a general overview of the timeline for the alternate assessments and the 1% work in Maine this year. So starting off with our first objective, what are the federal and state requirements when it comes to assessments, including assessment of students with significant cognitive disabilities? So both the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was reauthorized in 2015 as the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA, as well as the Individuals with Disabilities Act or IDEA, include requirements around participation in state assessments. The states are held really strictly accountable for these requirements, which in turn means that local educational agencies, or as we have in Maine, SAUs, um, are held accountable as well for those requirements. These regulations exist to ensure that all students are included in the statewide participation data. Specific to students with disabilities, IDEA requires that states make sure that all students are included in the state assessment program. That's either, either with or without accommodations and with the use of an alternate assessment if necessary. And it's the alternate assessment that we're here to talk about today. So participation of whom? So for ELA literacy and mathematics, it's all students in grades three to eight are required. Additionally, students are required to participate once during the high school grade span of nine to 12. 
It's a little different for the content area of science. Students are required to participate once across the three grade spans, elementary, middle, and high school. And in Maine, students participate in science in grades five, eight, and third year of high school. That's for both the general and for our alternate assessments. Additionally, for multilingual learners, there is an English language proficiency assessment, which must be administered every year on an annual basis until a student is exited from services, and that's in grades K to 12. So, States are permitted and authorized under ESEA to have an alternate assessment based on alternate academic achievement standards. And this is specifically for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. It's really important to note that a student only participates in either the general assessment or in an alternate assessment. They do not participate in both. The students who are eligible for alternate assessments must be provided with access to the highest possible standards achievable, the same as their grade level colleagues. And alternate assessments provide us with, of a measure, with a measure of what those students know and can do in relation to that content. We're gonna take a little more time to talk in depth about the alternate standards in just a bit. So transitioning now to our second topic and objective for today, um, to me, almost the most important objective of the session is why does participation matter? Um, this goes beyond what is required by law, um, whether it's federal or state law. State assessments inform a really important part of our state's accountability model. We are required to share with the federal government, but also with the people we serve here in Maine, how students are doing and how they're performing in relation to grade level expectations. So whether those expectations are written as a general academic standard, such as the Common Core, or as alternate academic achievement standards, we need to provide a measure as a state um, of how we're doing and helping all students, each and every student, to work towards those standards. If students don't participate, they haven't had the opportunity to be counted and every student counts, and we are accountable for every student. So the question becomes, are we consistently holding students to the highest standards achievable? Are we providing students with equitable access to rigorous academic content? That's a question we're asking ourselves. Do any or all of us know a student or students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who may have been eligible for participation in an alternate assessment, who is now in competitive and integrated or supported employment? Many of us do know, or we're aware of success stories of students we may not know personally. So then think about what are the skills and knowledge, including the academic content that have not only helped these individuals achieve such employment, but also contribute to their ability to maintain that employment. Participation in state assessments is not only required by law, it's also a matter of educational equity. The data helps provide a piece in the larger puzzle of how we are delivering on the promise of high academic expectations and college career readiness for all students. And so how is Maine doing? Let's take a look. This is our preliminary data from the spring 2023 administration of the MSAA or multi-state alternate assessment. We have a lot of work to do in making sure that all of our students in this population are being provided with the opportunity to participate in state assessments and therefore to be included in the state accountability measures for achievement and growth. As you can see from the table, around 22% of students eligible for alternate assessments last school year did not participate. That 22% does not include students in your districts who may have been eligible for the early stopping rule. Because if the early stopping rule is applied correctly, those students are still counted as participants because the SAU did their due diligence in providing the assessment the students were just not able to provide a communicable response method. Leora, can you go back? Yeah, there we go. 
So another way of looking at this data is that we do not have a measure of how 22% of Maine students with the most significant cognitive disabilities are performing in relation to grade level content. And that's concerning um, because we are accountable for each and every student. And arguably this population has some of the highest needs in our state. We're missing a critical data point for roughly 175 students. And it's a data point that informs state data and the allocation of resources. And one that ensures we're counting every student as a part of our accountability model. So we've spent some time talking about the requirements, including that all students in certain grades participate in the state assessments. We're gonna shift our focus a little bit right now. And Leora is going to talk about the 1% population from the perspective of who is eligible for participation in alternate assessments. Okay, so let's go into objective number three. So this language is directly out of MUSER, Chapter 101, the Maine Unified Special Education Regulation. Hopefully all the people in the room right now are familiar with what that is. So a child um, is identified with a disability if they're at least three years old, they have not graduated or um, left um, post-secondary education with a diploma. Um, and it is the administrative letter changed the 20 years, sorry, my cat, to, um, to age 22. Um, and that is being updated in statute when Muser um, goes into legislation, hopefully in the next session. Um, it is a requirement that the child be observed in the learning environment, their classroom setting, that they've been evaluated according to all of the rules in MUSER, and that they have one or more of the disabilities that are listed in MUSER slash IDEA. And these are the disability categories, autism, et cetera. So when we are looking at, um, you know, documentation of who has taken the alternate, et cetera. Um, we're really looking at those students who are identified with the most significant cognitive disabilities. So autism would be one that, that we would expect to see. Intellectual disability would be one that we would expect to see. Um, potentially a multiple disability because one of those could be part of a multiple disability designation. Um, what is confusing for us sometimes is if we see a child identified with SLD who's taking the alternate assessment. So hopefully you all are familiar um, with the eligibility process and the team goes through all the evaluations and everything goes back to that issue of adverse effect. Does this student's disability have an adverse effect on their ability to access their education? And if that's the case, um, then they are entitled on, uh, for specially designed instruction, SDI, to be able to access their education. Um, and Maine has the requirement to use at least one, sometimes more, depending on what disability categories you're looking at, um, to walk the team through that eligibility process. So each of these forms, the determination of, of adverse effect, specific learning disability eligibility form, and the speech or language um, impairment disability form, each of those forms has the adverse effect embedded in the form. So when you're going yes, no, or not applicable, for example, um, or not available, if you're talking about um, the adverse effect form, those answers inform each other and will lead the team to the decision about whether or not the child um, has an adverse effect. So we've both used the term significant cognitive disability at least once already today. Um, and this is the, uh, the definition of a significant cognitive disability. Um, a student that has been identified with one or more of the existing conditions, right? Because they all have to be within those 13 disability categories under IDEA and displays an intellectual functioning much below the average student that exists parallel to significant deficits in adaptive behavior. And that's a real key there, um, that, um, it, that exists parallel to significant deficits in adaptive behavior. That, that's a big um, flag for that. 
Um, students with significant cognitive disability require extensive, extensive instruction with goals and objectives connected to Maine's alternate academic achievement standards. So after the team determines that the child does exhibit an adverse effect and qualifies for SDI, part of the IEP process, um, 6B, asks specifically about the IEP team's decision about assessment. Does the child um, exhibit a significant cognitive disability and qualify for the alternate, or is the child going to take the general education assessment? So there is the participation decision document. Um, and this is the flow chart that we, it, it is a required document um, for the IEP team to complete when making the decision about whether or not a child could potentially qualify for the alternate assessment. This is not a form that's expected for any child. This is when the IEP team suspects that the child would qualify for the alternate, that's when you would use this form. And it again, it walks the IEP team through the process of making the decision about whether the alternate assessment is the appropriate one for the child to take. Um, I'm not gonna go through the form in complete detail, but you can see the first question is, um, the student has a significant cognitive disability, either yes or no, and it gives you what the criteria uh, is that is for that. Like, what do you need to look at in order to make that decision? So for that, you would look at the student records. Um, they indicate a disability or multiple disabilities that significantly impact intellectual functioning and, and here's this word again, adaptive behavior. Um, and adaptive behavior is, de is defined as essential for someone to live independently and to function safely in daily life. Uh, and you can see there are check boxes for the team to go through to be able to document what artifacts or um, records were looked at um, as part of that decision making. And you can also um, see that they're all data driven, right? Um, individual cognitive ability tests, behavior adaptive skills assessments, uh, achievement tests, informal assessments. So we're, we're looking for, for data driven decisions. Um, the student, the second one is really asking if the student is learning content linked to derived from the common core state standards. So this is where we would um, ask the team to look at the alternate academic achievement standards um, to align the student's academic goals um, to the standards that are derived from the Common Core. Um, and then question number three is looking at substantial supports. So what kind of um, supports does this, this child need in order to access their education? And the word extensive, again, is a big flag um, because all of our special education students require some sort of support. Um, but these students who qualify for the alternate assessment are the most significantly um, affected, cognitively significantly affected. Um, so that word extensive really applies to those students. Okay, Ooh, hold on. So these slides go through the first three sections that I just went over. And again, there's some examples, achievement tests, a Wyatt, a WISC, um, a Vineland, again, all data-driven um, assessments and evaluations. For the second piece, you could look at work samples, progress monitoring data, research-based interventions, that RTI process, and their present levels. So how are they working or what is their current academic and functional um, present levels? And then for the third piece, that extensive direct individualized instruction and support piece. So this is where the team could look at work samples, the data that you've been collecting as part of the evaluation process, 
checklists that you might be using in the classroom. Again, that present level um, of academic and functional performance goals and objectives. So again, these are all data driven. So this is some more information for teams to look at as they're making the decision about whether or not the alternate assessment is the appropriate assessment for um, the student in question. So a description of the curriculum and instruction, again, including data. We want to have ob objective information to make the decision um, whether or not the child qualifies work samples, again, data, um, examples of performance on assessment tasks to compare with the classroom work, district-wide alternate assessments, individual reading assessments, and then again, the present levels from the current IEP or from the RTI process, um, considerations from stu for students with individualized and substantial communication needs or modes, because remember, the students with the most significant cognitive disabilities may use devices to communicate with you. Um, and then whether or not that child could be a multilingual learner. Another piece for the puzzle. So what are the standards that we've been talking about, the alternate academic achievement standards? So the MSA, are... yes. I think this one is me. Oh, okay. I was on a roll. You were rolling. You rolled I was right rolling, by me. Rolling right over you. Thank you. Um, so now we have a better understanding of who the assessments are designed for. And we're going to shift our focus a little bit and talk about what the assessments are designed around, i.e., as Leora said, what are those alternate academic achievement standards and how do they relate to the general grade level content? So, oh, you can go back one, Lyra. Okay. Thanks. So just as a reminder and connecting back to what we discussed at the beginning of the session, state assessments are administered in grades three to eight and one year of high school for ELA and math. For alternate assessments, that high school year is third year. In science, those grades are five, eight, and third year of high school. And a phrase that you have heard us say a thousand times already in this presentation, the alternate academic achievement standards. So it's, it's important first and foremost when we're talking and when we're thinking about the alternate academic achievement standards to recognize that the name is actually a bit counter to the definition. So we're not thinking of these as a completely different set of standards, completely separate set of knowledge for students with significant cognitive disabilities. Rather, the alternate academic achievement standards are aligned to our state's accountability standards, the Common Core. These alt alternate standards have been significantly reduced in breadth and depth and in complexity to support this population of students um, in accessing that grade level content. So we are still working towards the promise of high standards and high academic achievement um, for all students. We're just doing it in a much more scaffolded way. So what does that look like? And I wanted to take a look at a specific example. So we're looking here at a grade three ELA example. Um, the general standard is to determine central idea of a text and summarize its development, summarize the key supporting details and ideas. So this is a pretty well-known literacy standard and probably looks familiar to many of us who have worked at the elementary level. So now let's take a look at what that looks like as a core content connector, the core content connector being our alternate standards in literacy. So it's very similar. Right, so determine the main idea of a text, recount key details, and explain how they support the main idea. So then what does that look like actually on the multi-state alternate assessment, that particular standard in action? 
So here you can see a release sample item for this particular alternate standard or core content connector. I've just kind of gone over the pipeline of alternate academic achievement standards to state assessments. So you can see I've included the alternate standard at the top. And here we've got an assessment item. Again, not a secure one, a released one, but what is the main idea of this passage? Um, the sun helps trees to grow big and tall, or that people can guess a riddle and win a prize, right? So here you can see it's a little different from our general assessment and a little less complexity um, than we might see on our general assessment where we've also um, got the supporting images to go along with each response option. We'll get more into test design a bit later. Um, but this is just an example of how the alternate standards derive from our general state academic standards and then how those are then represented in an alternate assessment. So it's, it's important to know that the purpose of the state assessment is to provide a measure of what students know and can do in relation to grade level content, in relation to, to what they're learning. The instruction and the services are what come first, so not the other way around. So in other words, we don't include alternate academic achievement standards in an IEP because that student is eligible for alternate assessment. We include them in an IEP because that is how the student is working towards those high standards um, and that high academic achievement in a, in a scaffolded way, utilizing standards that have been reduced in complexity and breadth. Um, and therefore, that necessitates an alternate assessment. The instruction and the services are what come first. We also receive questions like, um, can we just administer the general assessment to, the, to this student this year? We just wanna see how they do. Eligibility for alternate assessments does not depend on what the general assessment happens to be. Um, the question not only goes back to that eligibility guidance that Leora shared just a few moments ago, um, but also to the question we ask ourselves, which is what and how is this student learning? So I'm gonna go into a little bit about the actual um, assessment design of the multi-state alternate assessment, the MSAA. So first thing to know is that Maine participates in the MSAA consortium with 10 other entities um, that are actually from all around this country and the world. And you can see what those are here on your screen. So what this means is that for our alternate assessments, we are not part of a huge consortium such as WIDA, nor do we have a unique state-specific alternate assessment. Um, we're a member of a smaller consortium, which gives us additional support, saves significantly on costs, but most importantly, it allows us as a state to participate really heavily in the assessment development cycle. MSAA is in no way an off-the-shelf um, assessment program. So as part of that development cycle, one asset to the program is that we have the opportunity for Maine educators to lend their expertise to the process. And you will see recruitment notices that go out from me as part of the 1% newsletter, as part of emails to directors and alternate assessment coordinators. We recruit for item development for the assessments. We recruit for standard setting events that need to take place. We also recruit educators to review ELA passages for any potential bias or sensitivity issues. We also work to recruit across you know, the different areas of expertise within um, the many specialties that work with students in the 1% population, such as um, teaching specialists um, for students with deafness or hard of hearing, TVIs, um, functional life skill teachers, teachers of multilingual learners with significant cognitive disabilities. And we've also had special education directors and administrators participate in these processes as well. So that's a little bit about the, the group and our participation in the development cycle of the assessment. So just a little bit about the design itself for those of you who have maybe not seen the MSA before. It, the MSAA 
or alternate assessment is a highly accommodated form. So there are many accessibility supports that are already built into the test format um, before you even start thinking about things such as unique accommodations that may be on the student's IEP. So one example of that is that the test is read aloud to the student, the entire test. So that includes passages, that includes response options, um, and that includes items. Another um, built-in accessibility support is that the MSAA is always administered in a one-to-one -one setting, um, unless, for example, if it's a student who may need another person that works with them um, to be in that setting as well. So then it would be, you know, a two-on-one -on -one setting, I guess. So the MSAA is stage adaptive. That means that students are randomly assigned to one of three forms for session one. After session one, and based on their performance in session one, they are routed to session two form. And session two is at three different levels of complexity. And level one would be the least complex, level one, level two, and then level three being um, the greatest complexity. Most students participate in MSAA using computers or tablets. It's also possible to participate utilizing mixed modality. So um, a student, for example, who participates in one part utilizing technology and maybe in another part utilizing paper. Um, it's also possible for students to participate via a paper-based form if that's indicated on their IEP under assessment accommodations. We also have special forms available such as large print the three content areas for math, ELA literacy, and science are all administered within the same online platform, which is nice. Um, and that's also where the assessment reports are available following the assessment administration. Um, so that, that has an element of ease of use, which is nice. Um, gaining access to the alternate assessment platform is something I'm going to touch on briefly in just a bit when um, discussing our general timeline for this year. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Leora. Okay. I'll try to stop at the end of my section this time. Um, okay, so we're on to objective number four, which is the IEP. So what role does the alternate assessment and the alternate academic achievement standard play within the IEP itself? And how does that interact with general supervision and monitoring? So uh, 6B is a must fill on the IEP, whether the child takes the general or the alternate assessment, you cannot leave it blank. So if the child does take the alternate assessment, then you check yes. Using the notes from your participation decision flow chart, you provide an explanation about how the team came to that decision. Um, and then the academic goals would be aligned with those alternate academic achievement standards. There are two potential findings for a corrective action plan um, if when a district is in their audit cycle uh, related to non-compliance with the uh, alternate assessment with 6B. So the first one is ALT1, um, and this is again 6B. Um, it's important that the participation guide, the participation decision flowchart be used annually to determine whether the student continues to qualify and meet the criteria for participation. Um, again, it is a must fill, so please do not leave 6B blank. Um, and make sure that there's an explanation there about how the team came to that decision. And then the second potential finding is ALT2. So when the team is, is looking at your IEPs and they get to 6B, if the, if the answer is yes and the child participates, the first thing they're going to do is go to section um, five of the IEP and make sure that those academic goals are aligned to the alternate academic achievement standards. So um, it's important that it's actually a user requirement that on the IEP, there is a statement about why the child cannot participate in, that regu in the regular assessments. Why is the alternate assessment appropriate for the child? 
um, that's another reason why uh, 6B can't be left blank, because that explanation about how the team uh, came to that decision is required um, by Muser. Um, and again, this is going back to those, um, the alternate academic achievement standards. If the child qualifies, they have their goals of their goals aligned to the academic goals aligned to those standards. They also are required, again, under Muser to have objectives aligned with those goals. And I do have an example um, in a couple of slides. So um, Jody has really gone over this piece, but you know it's it's just important to keep in the back of your mind that the alternate academic achievement standards don't exist by themselves. They're derived from the Common Core. It's the it's the child with the most significant cognitive disabilities entryway into the into the Common Core. Okay, so they're aligned to the academic content standards at grade level. They provide access points to the general education curriculum. And we get a lot of questions um, about a student not working on grade level. Um, I was a special education teacher for 20 some odd years. I don't, I could probably count on one hand how many of my kids were on grade level, you know, over that period of time. So it's very, very common for a child with a disability to not be at grade level. What we want people to keep in mind is that you would start at the, at the grade level that the child is in, assume competence, and then work your way backwards to where you feel the child is, um, is, uh, oh my gosh, word retrieval at 3.30 on a Monday, sorry about that, uh, where the child is actually functioning, where their academic present levels are at that time. Um, it's also a way uh, to continue with inclusion in the IEP because again, they're, they are derived from the, um, from the common core. Um, and it helps keep the students on track for those post-secondary education and competitive work experiences. So here is your example. So Lily is, this is the present level. Lily is currently able to participate in conversations, including but not limited to eye contact with the speaker, use of text to speech device, and express her own thoughts in five out of, five out of 10 opportunities a week. So the goal is that she will participate in conversations and express her own thoughts in eight out of 10 opportunities, by the end of the next IEP. So within a year, she's gonna go up three from five to eight. And then there are two objectives below and they're just shorter chunks of the overarching annual goal. So the first one, um, since her IEP starts in November, I just arbitrarily picked February. So the team can decide what, um, what time period you want your objectives to be. It seemed like three months would be reasonable. Um, so within three months, we're going to get her to six out of 10 opportunities. We're going to get her present level up one more. Um, and then by May, we're going to get her to seven out of 10. So then by November, you know, fingers crossed that there's not a lot of learning loss over the summer, she'll be able to get to that annual goal of eight out of 10 opportunities. Okay, Jody, this is you. That's me again. Indeed. Taking it away. Okay. So what does the alternate assessment timeline look like for this year? So I'm going to share a general timeline um, with you. For those of you who have been serving as an alt assessment coordinator for the last couple of years, this, this should be pretty familiar, pretty standard. So right now, August, September, and October, I would say one of the most important tasks related to alternate assessment uh, that takes place now is that at the special education um, central office level to please confirm that all students who are eligible for alternate assessments based on alternate academic achievement standards um, have that alternate assessment box checked via Synergy. And I've got a screenshot of it here. This is within the special education record of Synergy. Um, it's really difficult to make sure that everyone's doing this. Part of the reason is because in district to district or SAU to SAU, it seems to be different people who are in charge of entering the enrollment information. 
Um, and so sometimes this step gets missed, but it's important to know that you know, if young Jody Bossio was eligible for alternate assessment last year and had the box checked for school year 22-23, it needs to be rechecked by someone at the SAU level this year as part of the enrollment updates, um, you know, provided that I'm still eligible via my IEP. So people go about this in different ways. Maybe some of the folks on this call already have their kind of standard operating procedure for making sure that that gets done. Um, but it's really critical. Now, that being said, it does happen, um, maybe not, not super often, but it does happen that there will be a change or an update to the student's eligibility for alternate assessments um, between, you know, our October enrollment deadline and when the assessment is administered in March. Um, you know, if that happens, obviously, we would go in and make sure that the alternate assessment box is updated, right? And so the reason that this is so important is because we utilize this synergy data to create our alternate assessment roster for every district. Those rosters are available to, to you in NEO, for those of you who have access to NEO. So those rosters are created again, directly from the synergy data. And that roster is what's used to create your student accounts in the MSA platform when it comes time for pre-administration tasks for the assessment. So if a student is missing their flag or alternatively has a flag in error, um, they could be inaccurately represented in the platform. Um, and then we start to run into some issues, right? With making sure that the correct students are taking the most appropriate assessment for them. So timeline, October, 2023. So SEU's work to finalize that enrollment, including the alternate assessment flag, like we just talked about. We will be having an alternate academic achievement standards virtual training. Um, it will touch on a lot of the information that we shared as an overview here, um, but goes a little more into depth um, into those alternate um, achievement standards resources. Also in October, Leora and I are working on preparing individual action plans for main SAUs. So what is an action plan? We'll pause here in our timeline. So action plans are required in the event that an SAU has exceeded the 1% threshold on alternate assessment participation. So what does that mean? It means that as a state, we are required to allow no more than 1% of our total assessed population to participate via an alternate assessment. In the event that we have exceeded that 1% as a state, um, Leora and I would have to write a waiver to the federal government, um, which is not our favorite thing to do, but if, but if, you know, if we're over 1% and we need to be over 1%, I would write that waiver every year. Um, the action planning process involves us reaching out to districts that exceeded the 1% in spring 2023. So the spring 2023 MSAA, and we'll be reaching out with a customized action template, action plan template that shares your 1% calculation for last spring. Um, it includes a section for justification of non-assessed students. So if you had students who were eligible and we do not have results for them, um, there's a section for you to kind of outline what happened there. Again, it includes that 1% calculation for last spring. Um, and then a justification of the overage. Um, and there will be an action planning webinar, um, you know, that goes into the plan in depth, but this is just an overview. Um, any ideas or steps towards working towards an achievable percentage goal? Um, as well as an opportunity to request main DOE um, support and technical assistance. So getting back to our timeline here. So in November, 2023, you would receive customized action plans um, and we would have our action planning webinar where Leora and I walk through each element of the action plan um, and answer any questions folks have. Also in November, 2023, there will be an MSAA test coordinators training um, following that, I will be sending out the test coordinator survey 
which I basically send to all special education directors and ask them to identify who is serving as the alternate assessment coordinator in the district that year. It's a really hard that this is not a contact field in Synergy. I'm sorry, not in Synergy, in NEO. In NEO, I can see who the district assessment coordinator is, for example, but as you know, frequently that person is not also the coordinator for the MSAA. Um, and I need those names to make sure our communications and our advertisements for trainings and our resources are all going um, to the correct people and that I'm finding those pockets where um, folks may be missing information and making sure it gets into the right hands. So that survey will come out following our test coordinators training, which is taking place on November 13th. In December 2023, we asked that SAUs who were required to submit action plans return those action plans to Maine DOE. We review them as a committee um, and follow up if we have any additional questions or any additional information is needed. Then we will be in the year 2024, holy schnoodles. It's gonna be here before I know it, oh my gosh. The summer flew by. Um, so in January, Maine DOE will complete its initial upload of students to the MSA platform. So I'm going to do an initial upload to capture any students on your alternate assessment rosters. I do that in January, start getting them into the platform. Also in January, I'll be having the MSAA TA training. So the, that's not only for folks who are serving as coordinators if they'd like to attend, but you know, it's it's geared towards those those people who are actually boots on the ground and administering the MSAA with our students. Then in February, 2024, the test coordinator and test administrator trainings will have one more round of trainings. Um, for those who may have missed it on the first go around, also as test coordinators, um, folks will gain access to the main as to the, <laughs> the main platform, the MSAA platform, be able to go in, check on their students, assign accommodations if necessary, do all of those pre-administrative tasks. And then in March, we will be in assessment season. So before, right before the assessment opens, I do one final upload to capture any students who may have changed between January and March in their eligibility. Um, and then the administration window will open on March 11th and it closes on April 26th. So as in previous years, we do get a wide long window um, for our alternate assessments um, and it will be closing on April 26th this year. And then before you know it, it will be the end of another school year. Um, but what we're looking at in terms of timeline here is that um, district school and student result reports um, become available. And that's for ELA math and science um, somewhere in that July timeframe. This year, it was July 17th to September 8th, the reporting window was open. It's usually about two months that you have to go in and to download those reports. So we have thrown, Leora, we have thrown a lot of content and talk, yeah. talk, 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 talk um, to this wonderful audience. So let's take a, I'm looking at the Q&A. I did see a question from Sean in there earlier. Um, and I'm not afraid to tell you, Sean, that I don't know the answer to this. So here's the question. Sean wrote, why do we only test grades three to eight and once in high school? I know overtesting is a part of it and that students have low tolerance, but is there a reason those specific years and amount of time? Sean, I'm not sure for the background on that particular statutory requirement, like what the background originally was in selecting those grades. Um, I probably could find some folks that know. So I'm not afraid to tell you, I don't have the answer to that right now, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I'm certain we could dig into it a little bit. Now I'm interested in knowing too, Sean. So thank you. <laughs> I'm just jotting that down. So I don't see anything else in the Q&A right now. Um, as a reminder, folks can always feel free to throw up a virtual hand. Um, you know, 
as I said at the beginning of the session, um, we will be sending out the link on our main DOE YouTube, the link to this recording. I'll also send out the slides as well as, uh, well, I, I'll send out the answer to Sean's question. <laughs> and if we get any other questions, I can add them to the Q&A document. Um, but I really want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. This is always a wonderful group to spend time with. And there is no perfect time to have trainings. And so we took a stab at a Monday afternoon. We find sometimes when we do them at lunchtime, folks have other duties. They've been pulled for other stuff and they're not able to attend and they prefer you know, to be there live. So if you can think of an alternate time that might be better to offer sessions in the future or any other feedback from the session, we always value hearing from you. And thank you to everyone for being here today. Bye. Have a great Thank day, everyone. You. Bye.